So uh, if you have a view, it, it, people will listen to it. I'll, be sure, I'll make sure they listen to it, I can tell you that. So if you have a view, you should say something. Is, is one month long enough, do you think? Do have a view? If you don't have a view, that's fine. But think about it. Uh, we're open to the question. And we'll be obsessing over it for the next year or so. <laughs> Maybe a little bit longer. Until some decision has to be made. Um, bear in mind that uh, if we change it, it will change it the World Health Organization. So, and it will eventually go into this what's called the International Classification of Disease (ICD). So it will feed down into the entire sort of medical mentality over over years. It's a big change. We made it. We made change. So I can this behind. There so, this is the current definition for an attack, um, which, again, probably won't change very much. We changed it on the last edition, actually based on large cohorts of people who are telling us about their, their history. Um, you, ha you have to have some sort of uh, bottom ceiling number to define the condition, probably. I struggle over this sometimes, the sort of thing I think about a lot, as to whether if you had one attack that would mean you must have the biology, but that's a, um, that's a sort of philosophical point almost. At the moment we require five attacks, we have these bookends of time, which of course are wrong, because one of the problems with these definition systems, you, the, the, uh, have, uh, let me make you understand, is that they don't try to classify everybody, they just try to classify most people. Because if you classify everybody, it has some look out any time you go sort of wandering around the world, go to a shopping mall. If you try to define humans by everyone you see, you have some very weird definition because there are some very weird looking people. Not a criticism of anybody in particular, but there are like really tall people and big people and incredibly thin people. And they'd be, but you know a human when you see one. It's just defining them is a bit, a bit difficult. But if you try and define most of them, 95% of them, and it's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. And that's what these definition systems do. They try to be um, highly specific so that if you use it, you'll almost certainly be correct, but you might lose something what's called sensitivity. So some people with the problem may fall out of it. As an example, if you're someone who has maybe um, at the far end, if, you're, if your attacks, each attack lasts in five hours, that makes, it doesn't make it into this definition, but that doesn't, Make, that's not doesn't mean you don't have the problem. It simply means that you're at the top end of the of the spectrum, uh, so to speak. All those other symptoms are the cranial autonomic symptoms, which I talked about, which we started to understand quite a lot about the anatomy of. We added this um, to the last edition, the sense of restlessness and agitation, because um, it makes sense. Most uh, people with the disorder will do this. Um, it doesn't add much to the definition, but when when you put all this together, it turns out. You only, have to, you only pick up maybe about 5% of people you weren't picking up before. But you pick up a lot from education. Um, so if you're using this sort of definition system to teach doctors, it's important that when they see the definition system and they read it, that the person in front of them makes sense to uh, make sense that makes sense that it's face valid is what it said. So we, we've, we've added this, um, we added this one in the, in the second edition. And I guess most of you would have this sense of restlessness or agitation or moving about. It turns out to be actually, um, it turns out to be a really important part of the, um, of the problem in terms of understanding the biology, I'll come back to that, which, is, which was for children. How many attacks you have a day, of course, is just a matter of bad luck in many ways. Um, less is obviously better. Um, more is easier to define, and too many is a real tragedy. I'm going to say some things that, uh, around it clinical side, say some research things and talk about some things that are happening in the future. Someone asked me, I put this slide in because someone asked me last night about what we knew about this and it hasn't changed much in the latest things that I've seen. This has been working with a couple of years ago on this question of how long to get diagnosed and how many doctors you have to see to um, get diagnosed. This is a, um, based on 230 people with um, cluster. You see, what the, the good trend is that in general terms, uh, patients get diagnosed quicker now than they were uh, 50 years ago, which is what you hope. Um, it's remarkable that on average it used to take 20 years to get diagnosed um, in the 50s. 
That's pretty bad. 20 years is a hell of a long time. Um, God, I, think I guess a whole bout seems like a long time to you. 20 years must be. That's just unbelievable. Um, it came down a lot, and I think it's come down to typically in, um, in, in, in most parts of the world, it'll take a couple of years to get diagnosed on average. Some people get lucky, some people get hellish unlucky. The average is much less than it, than it once was. It's always taken a few doctors to get it on average. Three or four, perhaps, uh, will uh, we'll, we'll see someone before they get the, um, get, the, get the diagnosis. And that hasn't much changed. It's partly in the UK, it's because the, I guess the, the doctor density is very high. And so the number has actually stayed pretty static over about 50 years. A few, you need three or so doctors to uh, make the diagnosis. Of course, this, this tells you um, that in many ways, I think it's something to do with how, many, how often you get, people get exposed to doctors. As time has gone on and there's more doctors, then the exposed, you get exposed more frequently. But actually, the way I read this, it's nice that the diagnosis happens faster, but actually, from an educational perspective, almost nothing's happened because it takes the same number of people to see you before you get diagnosed. You just go through the system faster. So what we haven't managed to achieve is to reduce the number of doctors who you see before you get diagnosed. And that's an educational um, problem, which has to be one of the great challenges of the next um, decade or so. Someone asked me this too, like oh, we were talking last night, so I, I put this slide in some work that we did a few years ago showing uh, what actually, <coughs> this is what happened to cluster patients before they got diagnosed. It's quite um, challenging, I remember when I first saw it. Um, it seems like, with all due respect to any dentists who are watching or listening, it seems like the worst thing you can do if you've got past a headache is see a dentist. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Um, because you'll get either teeth extracted or braces or filing, that sounds horrible, filing teeth that you've got, uh, or some sort of fascia maxillary thing done in about half, half of the time. Um, you know, if the first uh, root canal doesn't work, just do another one. Uh, or if the first tooth extraction doesn't work, take another one out. Take all the teeth out, why not? Uh, and then when they're all out, well, that, that's all done. So about half the patients had seen, had, had a dental procedure done, which is, it's crazy really, because they don't help, and they are often cause problems. Um, the other big one is the ENT people, um, about a third, probably more over here I suspect, because the, there's more of a perception that Cranial autonomic symptoms like the eye water or redness and nasal congestion are necessarily um, sinus problems. So people see, uh, we'll, we'll see ENT physicians. On the migraine side, um, it's a very common misdiagnosis. Someone did some work in St. Louis not so long ago to show that if you've got a diagnosis of, uh, of chronic sinusitis, and in the public, you just put an ad in the newspaper. But 80% of the time you won't have it, you'll have something else, mostly migraine. So there's a lot of overdiagnosis of sinus disease. And if you see a sinus person, you'll get sinus stuff done like washouts and antibiotics and people will move the septum around and so on and so forth. And that doesn't achieve anything either. Uh, and then if you see an eye, an optician, um, you get glasses, I guess. <laughs> because that's what they do. They've got a whole lot of glasses and you know, that's what they have in the shop. So I guess if you go to an optician, you get glasses. It's about a quarter of patients. I've always been, admired my ophthalmology, eye doctor specialist colleagues, who will see about a quarter of the patients and do nothing at all, um, which is the most helpful thing they can do. They just send them away, which at some level is disappointing, but so long as they don't do anything crazy, that's a good that's thing. So the, the, this feeds into this educational problem um, that while we need to educate uh, GPs, uh, other physicians better about the existence of the problem so they don't do things, um, we certainly need to target dentists um, so they understand that, um, there's a, that they don't really need to pull your teeth before anything else is um, done. I'm sure you've all got your own horror stories about that. So, do you have any statistics on any of these specialists that actually then made a referral to a neurosurgeon or neurologist or somebody else? In the main, um, 